On our third episode of the World War One history, we're going to talk about battlefield weaponry. At the beginning of the war, people weren't really ready for the war. Many people in Europe joined World War One as an opportunity to leave home find better places, travel, leave poverty behind. War was seen by many as a vacation destination to be ended in about six months. Knowing that, battlefield weaponry wasn't that great to begin at the start of the war. Weaponry was poor protective gear as well. At the beginning of the war, soldiers on all sides were issued with soft hats, no head protective gear at all. Soldiers' uniforms and equipment in 1914 did not match the demands of modern warfare. Later in the war, soldiers were issued with hard hats, steel helmets to protect against artillery fire. Artillery fire was a new concept. Before machine guns, they had infantry which shot one single shot. Artillery fire started having 600 rounds a minute. A simple rifle would have shot one, two, or three bullets at the same time. At no range, the rate of fire of a single machine gun was estimated as much as 200 rifles. Their awesome defensive capability was a major cause of trench warfare. War is war is ruthless. In August 1914, German troops shot and killed 150 civilians at airshot. The killing was part of a war policy known as Schreiklingheit, frightfulness. Its purpose was to terrify civilians in occupied areas so that they would not rebel. Germany was the first to use the flamethrowers at Melancourt in February 26, 1915. These flamethrowers could fire jets of flame as far as 40 meters. Artillery was fast growing in popularity and infantry was losing. In 1914, 1915, it's estimated that 50 people were casualties to artillery while infantry made 22 victims. By the end of the world in 1917-1918, artillery killed 85 people to each six killed by infantry. Artillery proved the number one threat to infantry and tanks alike. Also, the post-war psychological impact of artillery fire was massive. Called shell shock, it was caused by exploding bombs and artillery fire. As discussed in the previous episode, artillery had the capability of cutting people in half, shredding bodies. During World War I, dogs were used as messengers and carried orders to the front lines in capsules attached to their bodies. Dogs were also used to lay down telegraph lines. By the show of today's quality in infrastructure, I believe we are still using dogs. Russia mobilized 12 million troops during World War I, making it the largest army in the war. More than three quarters were killed, wounded, or went missing in action. At the end of the war, Russia had suffered heavy losses with an estimated two and a half million fatalities. Tanks first appeared on the battlefield at the Somme on 15 September 1916. They were originally called land ships. The name tank was used by the Brits to disguise the production process and lines from enemy suspicion. In 1917, explosive blowing up beneath German lines in Belgium could be heard 220 kilometers away in London. Building mines through no man's land, the name of the land between trenches, was a tactic used before a number of major assaults. Gas attacks became a thing. Approximately 1.2 million soldiers became casualties of gas attacks. Throughout the war, Germans used approximately 70 tons of gas. British and French forces combined 50 tons. Not so many people died, only 3% of war's casualties are because of gas attacks, but they had an incredible capability of maiming people. Dead or not, they were unusable on the battlefield. World War I was the first major war where airplanes were used at any scale. Around 70 different types of planes were used, mainly to spy or to plan ahead. Plane technology progressed, fighter planes were developed, and later on bombers as well. On 8 August 1918 at Amiens, 72 Whippet tanks helped make an advance of 7 miles in one day. General Ludendorff called it the Black Day of the German Army. The term dogfight originated during World War I. The pilot had to turn off the plane's engine occasionally so it would not stall when the plane turned sharply in the air. When a pilot restarted the engine in mid-air, it sounded like dogs barking. World War I brought a new era of warfare, the most significant development being air power, which unfortunately brought civilians in the line of fire. The introduction of poisonous gas revealed the fact that cavalry was ancient. It was clear that the days of the cavalry as a realistic fighting force were over, and tanks heralded a new era 
of warfare. Finally, the Nazi Blitzkrieg tactic of World War II grew out of the final Allied offensive of 1918, in which tanks, aircraft, artillery, and men were carefully coordinated. Mustard gas was really unpredictable. It never became the war-winning weapon as both forces hoped. In World War II, nobody used it. From the 1.2 million affected by poisonous gas, less than 100,000 people died. Most were just maimed for life. Poisonous gas sounds like a thing coming from Germany, but France was the first to use it. In August 1914, France fired the first tear gas grenades against the Germans. In January 1915, Germany first used tear gas against Russian armies, but the gas turned to liquid in the cold air. In April 1915, the Germans were the first to use poisonous chlorine gas. During World War I, over 30 different poisonous gases were used. Soldiers were given canned food, lots of beans in the mix. Nothing good could have come out of that. Also, soldiers were told to hold urine-soaked cloths over their faces and noses and mouths if a gas attack was to suddenly surprise them. As a backup method, anything was better than nothing. By 1918, gas masks with filter respirators usually provided effective protection. At the end of the war, many countries signed treaties outlawing chemical weapons. During World War I, British tanks were categorized as male and female. Male tanks had long cannons, female had heavy machine guns. Continuing with the phallic images, Little Willie was the name of the first tank used by the Brits. Built in 1915, it carried a crew of three and could travel as fast as five kilometers per hour, or around three miles per hour. The Pool of Peace is a 12 meter deep lake near Messines, Belgium. It fills a crater made in 1914 when the Brits detonated a mine containing 45 tons of explosives. One thing to show off, the Germans invented Big Bertha. It was a 48-ton howitzer used by them in the First World War, named after the wife of its designer, Gustav Krupp. It could fire a one-ton shell at a distance of 15 kilometers. It also wasn't the war-winning weapon they were hoping. It took a crew of over 200 men to assemble a single howitzer. It took them six hours and they only constructed 13 of these huge massive, enormous weapons. For the span of World War I, from 1914 to 1918, the German forces constructed 274 U-boats. These U-boats sank 6,596 ships. The five most successful U-boats were U-35, sinking 224 ships, U-39, sinking 154 ships, U-38, sinking 127 ships, U-34 with 121, and U-33 with 84 ships. Most of these sank near the coast, particularly in the English Channel. Germany was prepared for a long war, still mutiny kind of destroyed the ending, and this is seen even in the trenches design, more so if you compare German trenches with British trenches. The German were built to last and included bunk beds, water tanks with faucets, electric lights, doorbells on the doors, furniture, cupboards, and soccer fields. The French had what German soldiers called the devil gun. At 75 millimeters, this can was accurate up to 6 kilometers. The French military commanders claimed that its devil gun won the war. World War I introduced the widespread use of the machine gun, a weapon Hiram Maxim patented in the US in 1884. The Maxim weighted about 100 pounds. It was watercool. It could fire around 600 rounds per minute. Most machine guns used in World War I were based on this Maxim design. And finally, while today we have internet and sharing buttons, almost half a million pigeons were used in sharing messages. They were carrier pigeons and of course you, you're gonna ask yourself how could they know where to go if they haven't been there already? Would you just send them in random places? No. Pigeons, trained to go home, were dropped into occupied areas by parachutes and kept there until soldiers had messages to send back home to the source of the pigeon. They were used to carry messages between headquarters and the front lines. That's all for today. Don't forget to share, like, subscribe. I'd like to thank those 10 new people that subscribed since the last video. It's really, really exciting to see 10 new people in the subscribe number. In the next episode of the series, we're going to talk about some of the heroes that appeared during World War One, and in the last episode of the series, the aftermath of the war. That's it. I'm Alex, and until next time, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe.